control structures and arbitrary libraries. This is work done with Jacob Steinhardt and Percy Lang at Stanford University, and I'm also currently working at Google Brain. So let's unpack this title a bit and situate the project within the broader research area. In program synthesis, we, uh, the user describes a program that they want, and the synthesizer automatically produces a satisfactory program. And in our case, the user is going to give us input-output examples, and we need to find a program that has behavior consistent with those examples. So program synthesis is uh, a, an active area of research. However, many prior approaches have some, uh, some qualities that might make them less suited for general purpose program synthesis. So in particular, uh, many approaches um, use domain-specific knowledge to do very well on a particular class of problems, but they don't necessarily generalize to other domains. Some approaches use uh, only uh, predefined operations, and some can't scale if there are many different operations. So these approaches can't handle large libraries that programmers actually want to use. And finally, uh, some approaches do handle control structures, but in fact, many don't. So Frangel is a component-based program synthesizer, which means the user provides libraries of functions and classes that can be used in the program. And because of this, the approach must generalize to handle APIs in many domains, and it should scale to handle many different operations. Component-based synthesis is also very relevant in practice because programmers often spend large amounts of time learning how to use new APIs. SciPet is a prior work similar to ours. It's a, another component-based synthesizer for Java, and it uses uh, constraint solving to find sequences of function calls that will transform the input types into the output type. However, SciPet is one of the prior works that does not use control structures. And by control structures, we mean conditionals and loops. And loops especially have been a common source of difficulty in program synthesis. However, these control structures appear everywhere in real code, so we make it a priority to handle them well. This diagram illustrates our problem setup. The user is going to give us a Java function signature, some examples or test cases that illustrate the problem, and a list of libraries that can be used. Our synthesizer is called Frangel, and it will search for a Java program that has the given signature, uses methods from the given libraries, and it has uh, behavior consistent with all of the test cases. So let's go through a concrete example. Let's say we want to synthesize a function called rotate Q. This takes a Q and the amount to rotate by, and it modifies the input Q. For this problem, actually, uh, all of the necessary classes can be inferred from the function signature. So uh, in order to describe what rotating a Q actually means, the user is going to provide us with a variety of test cases. So if amount is 0, we don't modify the Q at all. If the amount is 1, we're going to take the first element and move it to the end. If amount is 2, we'll take the first two elements and move them. We also have uh, an edge case where the queue is empty and a stress test where we don't actually need to move elements a million and three times. It suffices to only move the first three elements. And uh, Frangel will actually um, discard programs that loop for too long on the examples. So this is how we make sure that we get a reasonably efficient solution. So uh, when Frangel searches for a solution, it will also print out programs that work for some of the examples. And almost immediately, we find that uh, if we remove an element from the queue and add it back to the queue, this will work for uh, the, the test case where amount is 1. And this code snippet is actually very useful, because if we put it inside an if statement, we can also pass the empty queue case. If we put it inside a for loop, we can pass other test cases as well. And by modifying this loop condition slightly, we can be more efficient and pass the stress test. And finally, if we put this code inside of the if statement from earlier, we arrive at a final solution. So notice that this uses a combination of control structures and four different Q functions. Frangel is able to find this solution in about 10 seconds on average. We also want to point out that um, this kind of problem uh, would be out of scope for uh, other synthesizers to our knowledge if they don't use um, domain-specific knowledge. So um, now that you have a taste of what Frangel can do, I'll describe how it works. And I'll start with a guiding principle. We make progress in a synthesis search by finding many distinct behaviors that are relevant to the task. So in the rotate queue example, we wanted to move a certain number of elements from the beginning to the end of a queue. 
and it was easy for us to move exactly one element. And this simple behavior isn't exactly what we wanted, but is still very relevant to the task. And as we saw in the example, Frangel is able to combine and manipulate these behaviors to find new ones. So for instance, we can put the uh, move one element behavior inside of an if statement, and we can create a new behavior, such as move one element, but only if the queue isn't empty. And by finding more and more distinct relevant behaviors, uh, we increase our chances of discovering the target behavior. So um, we will apply this uh, guiding principle to a baseline random search, and eventually this will lead to the Frangel algorithm. This random search just randomly generates programs until it finds one that passes all the test cases. Of course, this is too slow for non-trivial programs. Um, we're going to extend this with two key ideas. Key idea one is called mining fragments. So what if we find a program that passes some, but not all, of the test cases? We might be able to extract useful information from that program. So we've already seen in the rotate queue example that if we omit or simplify some of the control structures, then the resulting program actually might still pass some of the test cases. But this isn't only limited to control structures. Consider uh, computing the perimeter of a rectangle by adding the height and width and then multiplying by two. So it turns out that if we only include the height part and not the width part, then the resulting program um, still works if uh, the rectangle has zero width. So these examples um, illustrate a common property of programs that we call special case similarity. This is the observation that programs often have special cases that can be solved in a similar but simpler way. And we've seen how these special cases can occur by removing control structures or where degenerate inputs simplify part of the uh, desired computation. And we describe a few other ways in the paper. These special cases are simpler than the target program, which means they're easier to solve by chance. And they're also similar to the target program, so we can learn from them. In order to use this idea of special case similarity, we're going to remember the simplest program for every distinct subset of the test cases. And in this way, we're going to maximize our chances of remembering and then learning from a special case program. So consider, again, the uh, rectangle perimeter problem. Let's suppose we've generated uh, both of these programs by chance. And they each pass a different subset of the test cases. So we'll remember both of them. The next step is to extract all AST subtrees from these programs. And this gives us a uh, set of code snippets that we call fragments. Finally, we're going to use these fragments when we generate new candidate programs. If we have uh, good fragments, then the probability of generating a correct program is much higher. And indeed, in this case, there are actually several ways of combining these fragments to produce a solution. So to summarize, we're going to remember a diverse set of programs that are likely to be relevant because they pass some of the test cases. And then by mining fragments from them, we can uh, more easily explore a space of larger programs that have similar behaviors. And remember the guiding principle, um, the more behaviors we can find, the sooner we'll land on the target behavior. So this is the random search algorithm that we've improved by mining fragments. We're going to use fragments when we generate candidate programs. And whenever we find a program that is the simplest to solve some subset of the test cases, we're going to mine fragments from that program. But uh, this actually still has a problem. Um, which is that control structures are hard. And this is because we need to generate the correct body and condition of the control structure simultaneously. And we tackle this with key idea two, angelic conditions. So instead of requiring the body and condition to be correct simultaneously, we're going to decompose this problem. We're going to first find the correct body and then find the correct condition for that body. And we're going to use angelic execution to run a program even if we don't know what its control structure conditions should be. So here's an example. Um, this is for the rotate queue problem. And this program is an angelic program because it has two angelic conditions. And for intuition, you can think of the angelic operator as evaluating in the best way for each test case. So if the queue has five elements and the amount is a million and three, we can actually get the correct behavior 
by entering the if statements and then looping for exactly three times. And this describes a particular code path through this angelic program. This leads to angelic execution. For each test case, if we can find a code path that actually produces the correct output, then we say that the program passes that test case. So how might we uh, implement this search for such a code path? An exhaustive search would be exponen exponential time. So instead, we're going to enumerate and run about 50 code paths, prioritizing the simplest ones first. And in the paper, we describe an enumeration strategy that leads to a good ordering of the code paths with no redundant executions. So as the last step, once we find an angelic program that passes many test cases using angelic execution, we're going to resolve or fill in its conditions one by one. In order to resolve a single angelic condition, we're going to repeatedly replace it with a randomly generated Boolean expression. And then the resulting program might still have other angelic conditions. So we're going to use, again, angelic execution to run the program. And if it still passes all the tests that it used to, then we've succeeded for that sp uh, specific angelic condition, and we can move on to resolve the next one. And in this way, if we're always successful, we'll end up with a concrete or non-angelic program that still passes all of the test cases that it did originally. And this finally brings us to the Frangel algorithm. We're going to generate candidate programs using both fragments and angelic conditions, and we will run programs using angelic execution. Frangel will also attempt to resolve all of the uh, angelic conditions before mining fragments from any program. And uh, this strategy of angelic conditions once again fits with our guiding principle, because now we can take known partially correct behaviors and wrap them inside control structures, and this will allow us to find uh, more complex behaviors that are closer to the target. Now let's discuss some related work. I've already mentioned SciPets, which is another component-based synthesizer for Java. It uses uh, constraint solving, while Frangel uses a random search with heuristics. Angelic conditions have been described previously, but they were used um, in the context of a development tool, and we use them here for synthesis. Angelic conditions are also similar to sketching, which is a, um, a popular technique where we leave holes in a program to be filled in later. Frangel's strategy of using um, uh, of, of mining fragments is also similar to genetic programming, which has been used previously for program repair. However, there is a fundamental difference between the two. In genetic programming, we want to maximize a fitness function, such as the number of test cases passed. But uh, unfortunately, this might discard some programs that have useful functionality. So for example, if we have a program that correctly implements some edge case behavior, but there are very few edge case examples, then uh, genetic programming might not remember that program because it doesn't pass many of the test cases. In contrast, the mining fragments approach uh, remembers programs with diverse behaviors. So if we find an edge case program that uh, we haven't seen this behavior before, then um, we're guaranteed to remember it regardless of how many test cases it passes. And in this way, uh, mining fragments is less likely to discard useful programs. Finally, let's go through some of the results. In order to evaluate Frangel, we collected a set of 120 tasks organized into four categories. And this last category um, contains all of the uh, benchmarks used in the SciPet paper. And we can see that these benchmarks uh, contain hundreds to thousands of components that can be used by the synthesizer. And these, um, these tasks are specified using only a handful of examples. These plots show um, the percentage of tasks solved over time. And uh, Frangel is in the bold blue line here. And we also compare two variations, um, a variation that only mines fragments, a variation that only uses angelic conditions, um, one that uses neither, meaning the random search baseline, and also the prior work SciPet. And we can see in these plots that Frangel is consistently the best in our benchmarks. So on these simpler tasks in our benchmarks, Frangel is actually fast enough to be used interactively. So on the top here, um, Frangel is able to compute the bounding box around an array of rectangles in only four seconds. And on the bottom, Frangel can rotate a point about the origin 
um, using a given number of degrees in nine seconds, even though um, in this case there are well over a thousand components. Frangel can also solve some harder problems that can be tricky even for humans. So in this case, if given a swap operator, Frangel can um, sort a primitive array using uh, three control structures in only 30 seconds. This task illustrates that Frangel really can use arbitrary libraries. So um, this task is actually taken from an open source project, and it uses classes defined in that project. This sort of task would be very difficult for a human programmer who is not familiar with those specific classes. But um, in this case, because Frangel doesn't use any domain-specific knowledge, this isn't a problem at all. In this task, uh, we want to compute the eccentricity of an ellipse. This involves finding the lengths of the long and short axes and then plugging into this formula. So I wrote this benchmark, and um, when I tried to solve this problem, this was my best solution. I did notice that there is some code duplication, but uh, whenever I tried to remove this duplication, I ended up making the code longer overall. So I, I truly thought this was the shortest a solution could be. And then here's a comparison between my solution on top and Frangel's solution on the bottom. And at first glance, um, it's not clear what this is doing. Like, why is there a cosine here? There's a cosine here. Um, and it turns out that Frangel is actually applying a trigonometric identity. And uh, by applying this manipulation, the code just becomes so much simpler. So indeed, in this case, Frangel's code is better than mine. In conclusion, I've presented Frangel, which is a Java program synthesizer that can use um, control structures and arbitrary libraries. And it does this with two key strategies. It mines fragments so that it can learn from partial successes. And it also uses angelic conditions to decompose the synthesis problem when control structures are involved. And these two strategies allow Frangel to uh, take known behaviors and manipulate them to create new behaviors. And by creating these behaviors, um, we're able to make rapid progress in the synthesis search. And as a final note, all of the code and experiments are available online. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I don't see any questions at Slido, uh, so don't hesitate to ask. So let's go for questions to the audience, and I see some. Uh, hi there. Is there any particular uh, class of problems that is uh, more difficult you've found in practice to uh, synthesize using smaller, correct um, pieces of code? Yes. Um, so one key idea in Frangel is that we're going to use the test cases to gain signal when we're correct for some of them. And uh, this is really hard when, um, for example, you want to have some function that returns a Boolean because then you can have whatever computation you want and it's going to be correct for about half of the examples. So it's harder to get signal from the, uh, from the examples in that way. Okay, can we have more questions from the audience? If you have questions, please come forward. Um, so if I understood this correctly, um, when you, you had these, you, you would often have a series of angelic conditions guarding various control flow, guarding the loops and the if conditions. And you would, um, once you know this, these angelic conditions were enough to um, solve, the, solve the inputs, um, you would try to um, fill them in sort of in a linear order. You would fill one in, and then you would proceed to the next, yeah. and so forth. But I. And, and that should, I imagine, lead sometimes to a problem where you fill in uh, one angelic condition with something that isn't quite ideal, but it, the second one can still pass, and then you sort of proceed down a, a unfortunate path. Do you have like clever techniques for sort for backtracking and for deciding how to f what order to fill in the mm -hmm. angelic conditions? Um, we don't do full backtracking, but um, we did notice this problem. And um, so what we actually do is we first try to resolve the conditions in the order of innermost to outermost. Um, and the intuition for that is if you uh, uh, fix the innermost condition, then you've um, reduced the number of different code paths that you have, more so than if you fix the outermost condition. Um, but it, in the case that, um, that that is not successful, 
Um, we then try to resolve the conditions in the reverse order. Um, but indeed, there are still um, a very small number of examples that we know of where um, you actually kind of need to tackle two conditions at the same time in order to get both of them correct. So, so yeah. So it will do that if, if it fails in either um, No, no, no. So, uh, so yeah, um, for, for those kinds of problems, it would not be able to solve it. I see. Okay, we have time for one extremely brief question while the next uh, speaker sets up. Hi, with um, your double precision examples, how do you handle the fact that if you compute things in slightly different orders, you'll get small deviations in precision? Mm -hmm. Um, so actually, uh, our synthesizer is set up so that um, it can uh, accept arbitrary um, ways of comparing different objects. Um, so in this case, um, if you say, you know, given a double, two doubles, um, I want to compare them um, with some uh, epsilon, then um, then it'll work. Okay. Um, let's thank the speaker.